Come into the circle of loss. Come into the circle of compassion. Come into the circle of memory. Come into this circle of love. We mourn the death of Forrest Wall, who's no longer with us in the flesh, but his spirit dwells in our minds, our hearts, and in the way his deeds shaped our common world. Our loss, the hurt that we feel, our reaching out to one another, do not close that circle, but open it to all our brothers and sisters and friends. We're gathered into the sacred circle of humanity through the one fate that shapes our lives and through the grief that death always brings. There's a mysterious power that animates every living thing, a mysterious power that sustains what we call life. We don't know where we come from when we're born. We don't know where we go when we die, but we do know the life we live between the two eternities of being born and having to die. Between these two eternities is our world, our life. Some of us call the source of life this mysterious power God. Some of us prefer another name, internal, eternal being or creative force or spirit of life, or perhaps simply love. Some of us don't know what to call this mysterious power, for all names seem somehow inadequate. Yet we feel this mysterious power at the center of our unique beings. We experience it through the changes of our individual lives. We see and sense it at work in the life and in the changes of every living being. Like a flame passing from candle to candle, this mysterious power passes from being to being and from generation to generation. This mysterious power is the unity of all creation, past, present, and future. There is a mysterious power that animates every living thing, a mysterious power that sustains life through the unending cycles of the generations. In honor of this mysterious power, we light this flaming chalice, the symbol of the Unitarian Universalist faith. From this chalice, we light a candle in memory of Forrest's life. Let this flame symbolize all human life, as well as life itself. It's a fragile flame, and it can be extinguished by, by the vagaries of a gust of air, one of the guises of fate. But even if fate does not end a life unexpectedly, the burn, burning flame will eventually consume the candle. A candle has its allotted span to burn. So a human life has its allotted span of years to live. 
Yet while it burns for a short span or a long span of life, it radiates heat and light. And flame kindles flame, life begets life. The glow and heat, the passion of life, are passed on. So long after the candle is extinguished or consumed, the fire of life and love still burns. A human life also continues in the lives of those it has both engendered and influenced. Though the flame of forest life has been extinguished, our memory's eye still see him, sees him, and our mind remembers the power of his personality. How Forrest walked through his time and his world, how his life touched us and shaped our lives. In remembrance and honor of Forrest's wall, we'll light our other candles in this memorial service from the candle we have lighted for him. This is a tribute written by Marion Swall, Ode to Donna and Forrest. Half a century you shared, you shaped it together from plans and surprises and marital tether. Climbing life's hills, reaching round corners, you sang with the happy, lamented with scorners. Just like the bear who went over the mountain, you've hiked and camped and splashed in a fountain. You drove RVs, flew through the skies, taught well your children and heard social cries, stretched your ideals through essays and speeches, refreshed your go power by frolics on beaches. You politicked, organized, joined in a cause, traveled through life without fear of faux pas, yet wondered some days the right thing to do in a trio of lands where the foreigners were you. Arranging for meetings and standing before us, you've worked on committees and sung in the chorus. You've tunneled your way into many a heart and magnified a partnership to upscale fine art. Over the miles and over the years, you encountered the tests, some laughter, some tears, with soul-searching questions, raised eyebrows, big dreams on life's changing pathways, finding out what love means. We light this candle to acknowledge those who love to Forrest the most and feel his death most grievously. We especially remember Donna Swall, his beloved wife, their son Ron and his partner Jackie, daughter Tara and daughter-in-law Casey, daughter Maria and son-in-law Doug, grandson Ben, and Forrest's siblings Dale, Anita, and Nadine. We can't pretend to make amends for your loss, but we can give you the continuing promise to walk quietly beside you, hearing your words, seeking to understand the depth of your loss and the pain of your grief, and giving you encouragement and support to continue living. We pray that you receive the healing gifts of courage, wisdom, and thanksgiving. Courage to accept the reality of Forrest's death. Wisdom that life and death, joy and sorrow are joined and thanksgiving to celebrate the life that was Forrest's life. So, I am uh, Ben. 
uh, grandfather, I'm sorry, Forrest's grandson. I call him grandfather all the time. So uh, I would like to share with you um, my experience and memories of my beloved grandfather, Forrest Swall, and how he has taught me what matters in life. I'm sure that we all have our own stories with Forrest Swall, but my story with him begins inside of a boat floating through the fjords of Norway in 1999, and my grandfather has presented me with a Snickers bar. Now I was four at the time, and I'm sure that you can imagine the amount of anticipation that I had when I saw this. But little did I know that this was not simply a treat, but it was a device for an important life lesson. <clears throat> now, Ben, he said firmly, you can have this all at once, or you can eat a little bit now, and I can save the rest of it for you later. Now, I don't know how he convinced my four-year-old self to, um, to have just a little bit of this humongous Snickers bar, but somehow he did, because for that day and for the rest of the 14 days on our trip in Norway, he gave me one teeny tiny sliver of that Snickers bar. <laughs> and each time that he gave it to me, he, he insisted that I not uh, eat it all right away, but that I let it um, sit on my tongue, let it melt in my mouth. And this is what he told me was called Snickers pleasure. Now, this obviously taught me a lot of things. It instilled in me that it is important that when experiencing pleasure in life, that it is best when it is broadcasted over a long period of days. And while this might seem somewhat in insignificant, it has, it has had a humongous impact on my life since. Um, as many of you have probably experienced, since we live in an age where en entertainment is right at our fingertips, it, it is always very tempting to spend a day binging on Netflix instead of doing work. But every time that I decide to get to my work instead of, you know, spend a day absorbed by a screen, I'm positive that this experience, this lesson that he instilled in me at such a young age was part of what has helped me uh, stay focused on my work and stay focused on what matters in life. In the years that followed this trip to Norway, I discovered and appreciated many of Forrest Wall's qualities that I am sure that all of us love. He was confident, kind, warm-hearted, funny, and occasionally a little aloof. His stories on the farm um, where he grew up on and never failed to intrigue me and charm me. And through these stories, I learned that the values of having patience and learning to chuckle when life is not kind to you. His relaxed approach to life was a great role model for me, especially living in a hyper-masculine culture where men are usually encouraged to continually fight against life to the point where it can be self-destructive. When I was about 10, I d discovered with great glee that my grandfather, Forrest Wall, had served in the state legislature. At the time, since I was about 10, I could not fully appreciate the work that he did as a representative of Kansas. But as I grew older, I appreciated not only the amount of work that he did for the people of Kansas as a representative, but that he tackled is issues such as prison reform that few other representatives would dare touch because it can mean a death to their political careers. Now, I don't know how much of my grandfather's involvement in, re in reforming a broken prison system um, made it difficult for him to win the next election, <clears throat> but this was in inspiring be because you could tell that he was never in Congress to be a politician. He was there to be an agent of change. And through um, my older life, I discovered that even after his time as representative, after his time as a professor of, of social work, that he continued to be an agent of change until the very end. I remember the moment that I realized just this, 
that how much he cared about helping other people. This happened when I saw him speak to the Social Action Committee at the Unitarian Fellowship. Though he might have been talking to a room of about 30 people at best, he spoke about the issues with such conviction and importance that he might have been speaking on the floor of the legislature. This showed me that he was just as passionate about change in retirement as he was helping people, um, as he was when helping people was his job. Some of my last memories of my grandfather were him making calls to several people, uh, gathering donations for organizations like Just Food and the Food Bank. And I also remember opening his, his laptop just a few days after he passed away and I saw an unfinished letter advocating for Just Food that he had written. Um, This, all this showed me that my grandfather did everything that he did because he cared. He didn't do it because he thought that it would bring him fame or recognition. He served people because it gave him great energy and he served people because, he, because that was what genuinely made him happy. And as a person who wants to become a teacher, uh, this has taught me that what matters most in my job or whatever other job that I might choose, that it's not about making your, yourself seem cool or making yourself seem impressive, but that what matters is that whatever you do, you do it because you care about it.
We light this candle to signify that our sorrow and joy are one. We can't deny the grief that death brings. We have to let it spill from our hearts. We have to let our sorrow have its time because our joy has had its time. A wise man, James Martineau, wrote, we have a human right to our sorrow. To blame the deep grief which bereavement awakens is to censure all strong human attachment. The more intense the delight in their presence, the more poignant the impression of their absence, and you cannot destroy the anguish unless you forbid the joy. A morality which rebukes sorrow rebukes love. William Blake declared, joy and woe are woven fine. It is right it should be so. We were made for joy and woe. It's because we knew, loved, and delighted in Forrest that we feel such a sorrow for his death. Our joy came first. Because of the joy, we feel such a sorrow now. And though that sorrow is strong just now, there will be a new day when once again our joy in Forrest's life will be greater than our sorrow in his absence. We light this candle to signify the community that we create. It's good to be together at a time such as this. We need one another in our grief and in our love. The deep loss of death and the accompanying emotion of grief are, grief are best comforted by our fellow human beings. Friendly faces, kindly touches, warm embraces, halting words, or no words at all, convey shared empathy. We also seek together a meaning in which all things are comprehended. Death has a strange way of sorting out the essentials of life and living, and we see clearly through our tears what really matters. Family and the extended family that includes friends are things that really matter. It is good right and fitting in the face of death that we have come together today to remember the person that Forrest was, to mourn his death while celebrating his life, to seek a meaning in which all things are comprehended, to find each other to receive comfort and also, as each is able, to give comfort. I was lucky enough to come to Lawrence and the School of Social Welfare at the same time as Forrest. Summer of 1969, very brief, 45 years ago. I was doubly blessed, actually. We became close colleagues and close friends. And as if that weren't enough, my family, 
my wife Shirley, and our children, Michael, Debbie, and David, all of whom are here now from afar too, except for Shirley who has just been unfortunately hospitalized, but she's doing well. We became a part of the Swall family circle. Forrest and Donna, that loving duel, creators of Ron, Tara, and Maria. These created threesome. This created threesome. Then added their loved ones. Ron's Terry and Jackie. Tara's Casey. Maria's Doug and Ben. What a loving circle of world-class caregivers and how that circle has blossomed. I think inspired by Forrest and Donna, for me, circle members call to mind Romeo's declaration to Juliet. The more I give you, the more I have. Then so much more than these star-crossed young lovers, each circle member having given and received so much from one another, continue to expand care far beyond to friends, students, community. Today is a recent example of the family's caring legacy today. As you know, many of us have faced an absurd choice today. Celebrate this honorable man's life, as we are doing here, or participate in a rally taking place right now in Topeka, protesting the governor's order, rescinding employment protection for gay, lesbian, and transgender state employees, an issue dear to Forrest's heart. A mutual friend and colleague of ours told me a couple of days ago that she was asking herself this question, what would Forrest do? <laughs> I know, I know. Forrest would choose to be at the rally. <laughs> I'm even more convinced that he would honor and reject, honor, excuse me, honor and respect those who chose to be here, you and me here. Why do I know? That's the Forrest way. Who has ever heard Forrest disrespect anyone. Who? Who has ever heard Forrest devalue differing points of view? Who has ever seen Forrest not relishing communal celebration? As many of us know, Forrest for the last many years has been a devoted caregiver for his beloved Donna. During his closing days, he struggled, sometimes coherently, sometimes not, to tell me his concerns about what is happening, what's going on. Not surprisingly, I found out he was not talking about himself. He knew he was dying. He was talking about Donna. Oh, would he be happy to know, as he probably did, that she's in good and loving hands from his circle, starting with his children. I've learned that this is a family which has built mighty hands and arms strength. I think mostly from holding hands tightly and often and from most frequent warm hugs. And the circle blossoms with Jackie, 
the new woman, the new partner in Ron's life. I just met her, although I heard from the Swallows that she is totally Swallian, and they love her. <laughs> so immediately on meeting her in, the, in their apartment, in Forrest and Donna's apartment, I asked a very personal question to her about Ron, whom I happen to view as the most talented dual professional special educator and landscape gardener that I know. I asked Jackie, what can you possibly see in Ron? <laughs> Without blinking an eye, she sang out a list of virtues. He's caring, attentive, kind, funny, creative, energetic. Those were just some in the middle range. I said, Jackie, that's terrific. But you're just describing Forrest. <laughs> Jackie then quickly added, well, Ron has just built a gazebo for me in my backyard. Jackie, you're doing Forrest again. Anyone who has seen what Forrest built for Donna and from his own creative necessities in their lovely country home knows that. Just one example, a jacuzzi within a gorgeous porch deck overlooking the wooded countryside. Yes, built by Forrest with more than a little help from Ron. Forrest completely blended the personal and professional. Such a blend. So they, they became two sides of the same precious human coin. Modest illustration, a brief statement from the School of Social Welfare's 1993 recruitment brochure for undergraduate students. He was undergraduate director of the time, at the time, and his, for, and his photo looking very professorial and very mischievous was alongside. I have no idea who wrote that brochure or that statement. But I will read it. You are to guess the person the writer had in mind. OK? The heading. Social work. Is it for me? To find out, ask yourself, do I have an abiding belief in people's strengths? Am I concerned about the poor, the mentally ill, and other vulnerable people? Do I appreciate people's differences and the diversity of cultures? Am I committed to using my skills to advance the community's well-being? Am I interested in the political, economic, historical, and cultural forces that shape human situations? Do I need to ask? who that writer had in mind. Do I? No. But I should take care to celebrate Forrest without myth or exaggeration. No need. His actions speak so clearly. Was this marvelous man without flaw? Well, of course not. In fact, one of my favorite nicknames for him was Flawist. Was this man of high purpose and seriousness also a low-down humorist and belly laughter of epic proportions? Did this hard-working, disciplined battler against injustice almost always run late? Was his desk and garage a massive mess? Oh, yes. So much so, these contradictions, endearing ones. When Donna and Forrest asked me to speak at their 50th wedding anniversary about 10 years ago, I issued a challenge to myself. Could I capture his free-spirited complexities and contradictions in a strictly controlled form? A strictly, a five-line limerick. You know that five lines with, it's 
Five lines only, one and two rhyme. You know, you know the way it goes. Here, here, I did a warm-up, an easy, silly warm-up to illustrate the form. When young and fabulous Forrest Wall wore a newspaper tunic to a fancy dress ball, the newspaper caught fire and burned the entire front page, sporting section, and all. <laughs> then I went on, encouraged by that simple thing, to go to attempt the real Limerick tribute. And here's what I wrote. I worked on the Swall Limerick night after night, not able to get the verse to come out just right. When asked why this was, I said it, it must be because. I tried to cram decades of memorable years into the last line, which refused to conform with the limerick norm, and so I tried and I tried, and the more I tried, the more I cried, and was this cramming maddening? You have no idea. There can be no boxing in of this good man, a boundless spirit and joy. I will miss him for the rest of my days. I know this because I will remember him forever. Remember what I'm missing. I'm sure I will tear up for this brother of mine on occasion. I am also sure, more sure, will come, smiles will come naturally in so often. He was, after all, for a swall, a man of joy. Hey, could Beethoven have had Forrest in mind while composing his ode to joy? Hello, I'm Susan Cooper, and I'm a member of the Unitarian Fellowship of Lawrence. And I've been a member of the Social Action and Justice team at the UFL for a number of years. This past January, actually, the team chose me as the chair to fill the position that Forrest's passing opened up. As Mr. Garfield mentioned, this week our courage in the face of injustice has indeed been very challenging. He mentioned that Tuesday, the governor of the state of Kansas, by executive order, rescinded protection for state employees against discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Today at noon, concerned citizens led by Planting Peace, Kansas Equality, and other key organizations gathered on the steps of the Capitol building in Topeka to protest this obscene action. We have word that at the protest, Forrest was lifted up by speakers as a fine statesman and a terrific advocate. And I agree. If he were here, he would have been in the heart of the crowd, proudly wearing his Standing on the Side of Love t-shirt. I trust that he knows that I and so many others of us are pledging to keep up the hard work in his absence. Now, I first met Forrest back in 98 or 99. We couldn't remember when we talked about it, right when it was. I was a graduate student in sociology at KU, and as part of the student organization Queers and Allies, I had volunteered to be on a panel sponsored by their Speakers Bureau. I was pretty quickly brought to the task. Donna and Forrest were key individuals of PFLAG of Topeka and Lawrence. And that year, for the first time, the Lawrence Public Schools sponsored a, a session for teachers 
where they discussed issues of LGBT students. I was on that panel with about five others and Forrest moderated the panel. That was the first time I'd ever spoken openly of my own experience of coming out in high school. But most importantly, it was the first time I ever received such eloquent affirmation from a man of Forrest's stature. While I re-met Forrest several times over the years after that, including at the commitment ceremony of my cousin and her partner at the UFL, it wasn't until like 10 years later in 2008 that my partner Lisa and I joined the fellowship. I was thrilled to learn that Forrest was the chairperson of the social action and justice team, but it wasn't long before he had completely hooked me into deeper involvement than I had ever imagined. I felt like I was actually taking part in the most intensive internship I'd ever seen. <laughs> we researched and presented positions to the UFL, to the Lawrence City Commission, and to the legislative bodies in Topeka. We broadened the UFL's reach into the Lawrence community by supporting Just Food and by developing a network of community connection organizations. Under his leadership, we witnessed against state bills harmful to undocumented immigrants, and we spoke at community listening events pertaining to adding gender identity to the city's non-discrimination policy. Now, his enthusiasm was hugely contagious, but it was also daunting. He sent me a head-spinning number of emails each day regarding issues of social justice and social action opportunities. And one of my favorite memories of Forrest is when we were at, here at the Leeds Center protesting against Chris Kobach, who spoke in 2011. Forrest had spearheaded the UFL's acquisition of these yellow shirts, and he loved them. And many of us were wearing them that day. He was truly delighted when other groups asked us about them. And he just happened to have a big batch of them in the trunk of his car. <laughs> he sold about 15 shirts that day to other demonstrators. And he so enjoyed pe seeing people wearing them. For the last year or so, Forrest and I have been meeting once a week at the Merck to talk about the UFL social action initiatives or to touch base about city or state politics. But I'm pretty sure I was not the only person in the community with whom he met once a week and at the Merck. I came to think of him as a gentle bulldog. He had a quiet manner and a low voice, but he could argue passionately and steadfastly for his position. He actively mentored me, and I took copious mental notes on such things as how he diffused a situation with the heat, when the heat really cranked up between people, and how carefully he listened to what a person was saying before he replied. Over these years of working with him, I was blessed to get to know him also as a friend. I met his and Donna's children, of, home, of whom he spoke with such pride, and I warmed to him because of it. He, in turn, offered an understanding ear as I mourned the passing of my own father. I will miss him terribly. Of course, I'll miss the leadership that he provided in the UFL, at the UFL and in the community, and I'll miss his caring for those less fortunate. But I'll miss being surprised at just whose phone numbers were stored in his phone. <laughs> I'll miss seeing him ride up to the Merc on his bike to meet with me. I'll miss his slow and sincere smile and sometimes surprisingly wry sense of humor. And I will especially miss my friend who would, at the end of each of our talks at the Merc, at the end of each of our social action team meetings, at the end of any event where we both had attended, he would give me a sweet hug and say, see you next time, take care. Forrest, it's really hard to bid you farewell today. We've looked up to you. We've worked hard with you. 
We've benefited from your work, and we've loved you through it all. I promise you that we will continue the good fight against social injustice to the best of our abilities, knowing that none of us can ever really take his place. But we will pick up the banner, and we will carry on in your name and in your memory. See you next time, my friend. Take care.
we light this candle to honor the mystery of life. William Shakespeare wrote, we are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our life is rounded with a sleep. In awe and wonder, our thoughts leap from understanding to understanding about a human life and the double mystery of where we come from when we are born and where we go when we die. This is a time for each of us to find the quiet center and meditate to gather our individual feelings and thoughts, to meditate upon the meaning of this occasion, to offer a private and final farewell, to lift up a prayer, to remember the person that Forrest was and to acknowledge how he lives on in us. With the sounds of crystal bowls, we enter this time of personal reflection, meditation, and prayer. Thank you. 
As you've noticed and we've heard about, we see a lot of yellow t-shirts here today. They say, standing on the side of love, because that's the slogan for an interfaith public advocacy campaign that seeks to harness the power of love to end oppression. It's sponsored by the Unitarian Universalist Association and many of the Unitarian Universalists are wearing their shirts today in honor of Forrest. Because as Susan mentioned, Forrest was like the standing on the side of love guru in our congregation. He was passing out t-shirts and urging us to wear them at every opportunity. I wore my standing on the side of love stole today in his honor. To stand on the side of love was more than just a slogan or a campaign in Forrest's life though. It was love that drove the whole of his life, both public and private. I got the call just a few days after Christmas. Forrest wanted to talk with his family about his ongoing cancer treatment and he hoped that I could be there. When I walked into the apartment that he and Donna shared, he, they were stretched out in their lounge chairs in the living room, side by side, hand in hand, with their children gathered around close. Forrest was very weak at that point and didn't have much strength to his voice, but he used what strength he had to tell us what he had to. He decided to stop the chemotherapy treatments and to let nature take its course. And that news was received with quiet love and grace. But that was not all that Forrest had to say. One by one, he addressed each person in that tight little circle, telling them how much he loved them what they'd meant to his life, even whispering his best love memories of them. I remember he told me that when he and Donna were married, they felt it was for eternity. That became somewhat of a theme in the conversation that their love would live on in the family and the larger community in so many ways. And then one by one, each family member told Forrest everything he'd meant to them. It felt unplanned, spontaneous to me, but I wonder if Forrest had meant for it to happen exactly as it did. I loved the story of how Donna and Forrest met. Donna was engaged to another young man at the time and her family didn't approve, so they broke up, which is when Forrest moved on in. <laughs> They were at Graceland College together, but Forrest knew he was about to be drafted, so he asked a young teenager he'd met, a boy named Ronald, if it would be all right if he wrote to ask, to look up Donna Stearns and ask if it would be all right if he wrote to her. Well, Ronald agreed to this plan, and somewhat later at a prayer meeting, he turned to the young woman sitting next to him and said, excuse me, do you know Donna Stearns? I'm Donna Stearns, she said, and yes, it was okay for Forrest to write. It seems that Forrest continued to favor the slightly indirect approach as later, at a later visit, after he'd hitchhiked from Georgia to Seattle to see Donna. He asked, what would you say if I were to ask you to marry me? And Donna replied, well, if you were to ask me, I'd probably say yes. That was the right answer. All his life, Forrest cherished memories of his childhood working on the family farm with his father and brothers. He loved hard physical labor, and he passed that love on to Ron, who remembers that there were at least three foundations that Forrest dug out by hand to deal with leaks, that he planted tree after tree at their home in Lawrence, delighted in scattering the daffodil buds every year and watching the flowers pop up in the spring. This was work that Forrest usually did alone, because that was the time for him to think his thoughts. And it was work that had tangible, visible results that provided a real feeling of accomplishment. So much of Forrest's work in the community relied on his profound faith that someday it would make a difference, even if he wasn't there to see it. As I listened to the family stories the other day, I was struck by the way Forrest supported and empowered his children in a way that many parents don't. 
When the children were old enough to stay home from school, they'd sometimes bicker, as kids often do, and they'd call Donna or Forrest at work to let them know who had done what to whom and what were their parents going to do about it, which was frustrating for the parents because from work they couldn't do anything about it. And then Forrest had the idea of holding family meetings in the evening. And he told them, if something happens during the day and you want to talk about it, don't call. Just bring it up later and we'll talk about it together at the family meeting. In a richly metaphorical way, Forrest empowered his children when, as little kids, he let them share the traveling process by teaching them to drive. He taught them how to steer. He set up a box in between the two seats of the van and let them work the gears and doing loops in the park. He taught them how to meet cha challenges, driving challenges. Forrest could pull off a perfect three-point parallel parking job in a space with only inches to spare. That's a skill that Tara later enjoyed showing off in Los Angeles. Maybe one of the most interesting quotes that I've heard attributed to Forrest was, everything I ever needed to know, I learned from my cows. <laughs> Working on the dairy farm as a child, Forrest and his brother Jack were charged with milking the cows every morning, bringing them into the barn. And by observing the behavior of each cow, Forrest figured out early on how to work with them so it would be easier to bring them willingly into the barn. They wanted to walk into the barn in a certain order. One cow, Nellie, always had to go last, and she always had to take a couple of loops around the yard before she entered. Forrest learned that you could try to force the cows to do it your way to be more efficient, but then it was harder to get the milk. And if you were anxious, they'd sense it, and it would be harder to get them to cooperate. But if you tried to understand what they wanted and met their needs, then everyone was happy. Of course, that's how Forrest worked with people, with his own children, with friends and family, with community leaders, even and maybe especially with people he did not agree with. He believed in the power of tuning into people, learning what motivated them, listening, staying engaged, and he almost never let a relationship go. Whoever you were, whatever you believed, he accepted that. Oh, we'd still try to persuade you to his point of view, especially if it involved a justice issue, but he stayed in relationship. Today, as we honor Forrest's life, we're also honoring his legacy, of course. We're reminding ourselves and each other that he meant for us to carry on his work this work of love and commitment that gave his life meaning. But what is the most powerful message of Forrest's life, the most meaningful and memorable message, is not so visible, except to those who were very close to him over the years. So I share it with you now. Listen to what Forrest's life had to teach us all. Even in a culture of violence and bigotry, there is always, always, the possibility of transformation and redemption and hope. Remember, believe, that is what it means to stand on the side of love. It would have still been an inspirational story to us all if Forrest had been raised in an environment where fairness and peace and care for the most vulnerable had informed his young life, but in fact, that's true for very few of us. And that was not true for Forrest. His father, like most parents of that era, had believed in spare the rod, spoil the child. There's a story about Forrest being whipped as a boy for accidentally carrying a 25-pound bag of expensive sugar to be burned with the trash. And when he first found himself in a parenting role, when a young teenage nephew was spending the summer with him and Donna, when the boy first badly misbehaved, Forrest responded in the way he'd learned. He whipped him. And immediately afterwards, went to Donna and said, I am never going to do that again. That is not the way to treat a child. 
By the time his own children had arrived, when they'd bicker in the back seat on long car trips, Forrest would just pull over to the side of the road and wait. When you're finished fighting, I'll start driving again, he'd say. When Tara needed attention as a child, he'd sit in a chair with Tara on the floor in front of him and rub her shoulders. That gave them the connection to let Tara talk about what was going on in her life and to listen to Forrest. And he told her, whenever you feel like you need some attention, you can interrupt me and whatever I'm doing, I'll stop and give you a shoulder rub. Forrest realized we can stop the cycle of violence. And when Tara came out as a lesbian in her early 20s, at first Forrest didn't understand and reacted negatively. That was still a time when very, very few people, let alone parents, understood. In later years, he was disappointed in his younger self. He saw the pain that such rejection by their own parents caused to gay and lesbian youth, and he knew that no child, no child should ever have to be afraid they'd lose the love of their parents. And that's when he decided that he could help parents become more aware, more embracing, and not only parents, but social workers and school systems. Forrest realized we could stop the cycle of bigotry. Transformation isn't a one-time act. It's a lifetime process. And Forrest never stopped actively living his faith in the power of love to create justice. Even through the repeated disappointments that every activist experiences and takes so much to heart. Just over a year ago, he helped me lead a worship service about the new Jim Crow, the mass incarceration and denial of voting rights to African Americans now in the 21st century. And he sent me a long, reflective email describing his work on criminal justice reform. Forrest described what he saw as initial success with the Kansas legislature that was subsequently eroded. And he said it gave him a sense of failure, seeing in retrospect the seeming powerlessness of significantly affecting needed change. He wrote, even colleagues who agreed with me were reluctant to speak up. I could not remain silent. What Forrest didn't point out, but that was the subtext, was his own courage and great perseverance in the face of repeated failure with only intermittent success. He had hope, but he had more than hope. He had life experiences. He'd seen the changes that ongoing engagement can bring over time in his own life, and in the life of the community and the world. Maria says, Dad taught us that just because a door closes, it doesn't mean you can't get into the building. It may take some effort to look for another way, to ask the right people to unlock the door or let you in the side door, and you might even have to find a ladder to reach the open window on the top floor, but if you work at it, you may find a way. And you all know, he never gave up. Right to the end, founding Just Food, speaking up for affordable and safe housing, working for immigration reform and against the death penalty until the last few weeks of his life, Forrest was there for all of us, standing on the side of love. And so I leave you with this image, beautiful in itself, powerful in its symbolism. A little over a year ago, November 2013, after 29 years together as a committed couple, Tara and Casey are legally married in California. And Forrest gives a toast, sending greetings from Paul Davis, whom Forrest calls the future governor of Kansas. He speaks movingly of Casey's parents, knowing how much that means to her and Tara saying how happy they would be to share in this if they were still living. He speaks about what the shared life of Tara and Casey means to him and Donna, and his joy that they're able to have their love recognized in the same way that's always been possible for Ron and for Maria. 
the most important thing for Forrest is the happiness and love that Casey has brought to Tara. This is the legacy we all inherit. May we all do our best to carry it forward. The most important thing in life is love. We light this candle in thanksgiving. We're thankful for the gifts of life, even though our individual lives are rounded by a sleep. We're thankful for Forrest's life. We're glad to have seen Forrest's face, to have been influenced by his personality and his ways, to have loved him, and to have been loved by him in return. Forest deeds continue to influence, influence those he touched and our larger world, for we're all woven into one tapestry. We're thankful that time lessens and memories heal the grief we feel at death, bringing ever deeper understandings and a more loving acceptance of the one who has died. We're thankful for the comfort we give one another, which has grown among us during this time. We're thankful that love and life continue, passing from generation to generation. We're thankful for the love that never dies. It's true that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends.
And so we light a final candle for love. The love we have for life and its mysterious but sure source. The love that forest had for us. The love we have for forest. The love that has brought us together. In the spirit of this love, we say our goodbye to forest. I would invite everyone to rise in body or spirit as you're able for our final song and to sing along with the chorus, which will be printed on the screen. of remembrance and celebration, a service of sorrow and joy for the life of Forest's wall. We will extinguish Forest's candle, but as we do, we see that the candle of life still burns, as do the candles of community, thanksgiving, love, that we have lighted from Forest's flame. And this is our benediction. Spirit of life be with us giving us the peace of acceptance and understanding and the assurance in those things that never die, those things that pass from person to person through the generations into eternity, especially love. 
In the spirit of love, we have gathered. In the spirit of love, we depart. It was such an honor. <laughs> 